So, good evening, everyone. It's a great pleasure to have you all here, and it's a very great pleasure pleasure to have Ben Ansel to give the February Max Weber um, Max Weber talk. And I'll leave the longer presentation of Ben's work to Harry Begg, who is a Max Weber fellow with us, who will be chairing this session as well. Thank you, uh, you host. So. Um... Thank you, Ben, for, for coming uh, for this lecture. Uh, ben is Professor of Comparative Democratic Institutions at Oxford University, uh, where he is also a professorial fellow at Nuffield College. Among various roles, he is a fellow of the British Academy, uh, an editor of Comparative Political Studies. And until last year, he was principal investigator of Wealth Poll, which was a uh, is a European Research Council project with the EU flag there uh, 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 on the political and uh, on the politics of wealth inequality and mobility in the 21st century. Uh, he has written dozens of articles uh, and has uh, written or edited at least five books. The two uh, two most recent being Inward Conquest: The Politics political origins of modern public services and why politics fails, the five traps of the modern world and how to escape them. Uh, recently, Ben was also the BBC's Wreath Lecturer, in which role uh, he delivered a highly acclaimed series of lectures on the theme of our democratic future. They're available online uh, by the BBC. This is not plugging uh, Ben, but available online by the BBC and highly recommended for those uh, who are yet to listen. Uh, today, Ben is delivering his lecture on who wants wealth taxes uh, based on at least some of the work done during his ERC project. So uh, thank you, Ben. We're very much looking forward to hearing you speak on this uh, fascinating topic. Thank you, Harry, for that. And thank you all. I didn't know there'd be applause, so that's very kind of you. Um, thank you for that very kind introduction. I'm just going to try and make sure that I have this at the correct level, so I'm not screaming at you, but I'm also dealing with the acoustics of medieval Italy. Um, it's lovely to be back here. I said to you her earlier, the last time I was in this room was when my wife was registering as a Max Faber Fellow in 2008, uh, which means I'm getting quite old, uh, but it's always lovely to be back here. I was a visiting Max Faber Fellow, which meant they didn't pay me anything, but I got to hang around. And that was also great. Um, what I am going to talk to you about today, hello, Daniel, um, is um, work that comes, as, um, as Harry said, from my European Research Council grant that, that ended just over a year ago um, and was on the politics of wealth inequality. And I'm going to focus on one area in particular here, which is taxing wealth. Now, there's all kinds of interesting things one could look at with regards to wealth. Uh, so you, we might be interested in why wealth is more or less unequal across different countries. And that's something we look at a bit in, in our work. Mm -hmm. We might be interested in the relationship between wealth and voting, uh, and in particular voting for populists. And that's something I also did in this project. And you might also be interested in building wealth, building houses. And so all of that stuff is interesting. I'm not going to talk to you about any of it today, um, but I will point you to some of the places where I'm talking about it in a more or less user-friendly way. Um, but let me begin with the important stuff, which is acknowledging these six people uh, who were my collaborators, um, who were all part at various points of wealth poll and Look, I'm a terrible manager. I don't think most people go into academia to manage people, and then at some point you have to. But the great thing about managing people in academia is you're managing other academics, and so you just let them do interesting things, and they go off and get interesting jobs afterwards. And they are responsible for all the all the good things that you're about to see. Um, so Mads Elkia is the lead author, I should say, in particular, on the sort of middle part of today's presentation, which is going to be about inheritance tax in the United Kingdom. And Matthias Haselberger is the lead author on some of the latest stuff, um, which will be on a survey we do in Europe on wealth inequality, but everybody contributed in various ways to, to these projects. So uh, I was also really excited to use the drop shadow function for these photos in Keynote. So I think that, that looks very lovely. Okay, um, Harry mentioned this and you know now I'm doing all this public intellectual nonsense. I have to constantly self-promote. So let me self-promote a little bit. Um, I wrote a book for the general public, 
uh, you guys are part of the general public too. That's the great thing about it, it's everyone. Um, and it was an attempt to kind of summarize a lot of my work. And of course, more importantly, lots of uh, great scholarship out there in political economy on really big questions, uh, democracy, equality, solidarity, and so forth um, in the book. If you're interested in the book, it's out in all good bookshops. So it's not out in Italian. So for any Italian publishers here, you know, now's your chance. Um, but I do talk about some of the uh, some some of the big questions about wealth inequality that I'm going to be focusing on today at quite a grand level. So some of the uh, examples I, I give you at the beginning of this lecture will be from that book. And the other thing I just did, as Harry mentioned, is I gave the wreath lectures for the BBC. The wreath lectures come out just before Christmas every year, but they're not just for Christmas, they're forever, because you can, if they're, they're the only thing that the BBC never take off uh, and never charge people to listen to. Um, quite why the BBC thinks that the general public wants to listen to 40 years of intellectuals blathering on about things I don't know. But you can listen to them there. I gave one on democracy, that's the top left, one on security, which is the cell phone on the top right, one on solidarity, uh, which I suppose is closer to the theme of today's lecture, and then one on prosperity at the bottom. All right, enough self-promotion. What am I going to do today? I, I, firstly, I want to give you a motivation about why it should be interesting to think about why we tax wealth. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you three empirical exercises. So it's going to be mostly an empirical uh, lecture. I'm very happy to talk about different arguments through this. I'll give you my quick take as we go through about why I think wealth taxation isn't as high as we might expect it to be, and that's going to be the big puzzle of today. Uh, but we're going to explore this using a variety of different surveys uh, throughout Europe. So that's going to be the empirical focus. Uh, and most of this work will be done in a variety of surveys I did in the UK. Uh, and that's partly because I ran three of them in the UK, so I have lots of data. Uh, but it's also because we haven't fully analysed all the European data yet. So you are getting in this audience uh, you know, a, a first cut uh, an early release of the European data. Um, so there we are, that's exciting. So let me begin with this puzzle. Here's Elon uh, Musk and Bernie Sanders. And I don't know if you can read their Twitter exchange here, uh, but I'll read it out for you. It's Bernie Sanders saying, we must demand that the extremely wealthy pay their fair share, period. Period is the kind of thing Americans say when they want to emphasize things, although not normally in a tweet. Uh, then Elon Musk says, I keep forgetting that you're still alive, which is the delightful humor we've all come to associate with Elon Musk over the last few years. And then he says, and this is a bit more interesting, want me to sell all my stock, Bernie? Just say the word. So what Musk is, is saying in response to the Sanders wealth tax, which I'll come on to in just a second, is sure, you want to tax my wealth. OK, well, I'll sell all my wealth off and then I'll consume instead. I'll get rid of the wealth and I'll turn my wealth into consumption. And then I guess you'll just have to tax me like everybody else. And that's one answer, as we'll see, to a big puzzle in political economy, uh, a puzzle even bigger uh, than why the poor don't generally expropriate the rich, is why don't the non-wealthy expropriate the wealthy? Now, this is the kind of puzzle that political economists uh, love to talk about and write articles about over the last 30 years. There's a cottage industry in talking about what's called the Meltzer-Richard model. The Meltzer-Richard model um, from Alan Meltzer and Scott Richard in the 80s was a model that, uh, you know, a basic kind of rationalist model that assumed that poorer people would like to pay, uh, sorry, would like higher redistribution, which people would like lower taxes. That's obvious. But that high levels of inequality would mean there was more from the rich to take by the poor, that the goose was fatter uh, to slaughter. And so that higher inequality would lead to more redistribution with income. Now, um, kind of follow up to that is that most political economists have spent half of their life trying to understand why the Meltzer Richard model doesn't work. And I have written whole books as myself being like the Meltzer Richard model doesn't seem to work. So I realize it's a bit of a straw man, but if it's gonna work anywhere, one would expect it to work with wealth because wealth is far, far more unequally distributed than income. Uh, and indeed, not only is it more unequally redistributed, but the way in which it passes from person to person might seem more unfair in the sense that it, it comes either from lucky windfalls, with speculation, or uh, from bequest, from inheritance. Now, of course, wealth can also come because you worked hard and saved to get that. But you might think that there are a variety more reasons 
to think that people would be happier to tax wealth and wealth is much more unequally redistributed and very few people own a hell of a lot of the wealth in society and that wealth is quite specific often right quite easy to identify so we end up with this funny situation where the american electorate which in 2020 was about 159 million people were unable to elect didn't want to is another way of phrasing this elect a candidate who wanted to tax americans with wealth of over $10 million. And that candidate is Bernie Sanders here on the right, uh, along with Elizabeth Warren. And I'll talk about this again in a second. Um, a number of the candidates for the nomination for president, um, the Democratic nomination for president, um, wanted to tax wealth above certain levels annually with a net wealth tax. Uh, normally the threshold was somewhere between 10 and $30 million. Very few Americans have more than 10 to $30 million in wealth. That is roughly the number, 75,000 at 10 million. And so you might think this is a, isn't a fair fight, right? 159 million Americans ought to be able to tax 75,000, and yet the wealth tax does not exist. It got nowhere close. Joe Biden, of course, won the nomination, not Sanders or Warren. Just going to enjoy that. Beautiful. Um, okay, so wealth highly unequally distributed, uh, and yet the kinds of policies that might directly address that seem anathema to politicians. Um, now, in the UK, which we'll be looking at today, there's less intense wealth inequality. So the UK income Gini statistic is about 0.4 to 0.45, depending on what we're measuring exactly. And the wealth Gini is 0.62, but it's much higher for stocks and shares and financial wealth, right? So one of the reasons why wealth inequality is lower is lots of people have occupational pensions, and lots of people have housing. Okay, But in America, it's extremely high. And so then we have this big question, you can see at the bottom, why doesn't equality of votes lead to more equality of wealth? And that ought to be intensifying, one might think. This is data from um, Oxford's Our World in Data. Uh, this is the share of wealth belonging to the top 1%. Some of this draws from Emmanuel Saiz's work, and we'll see him in just a second. So you can see that in the US, the share that the top 1% have of all wealth has, well, not quite doubled, but nearly from the low 20s to almost 40%. Okay. And even in less unequal places, there's generally an upward trend. I cannot tell you what was going on in France in particular for these measures. <laughs> Who knows how that's measured? But in the UK, which has less funky statistics here, it's going up from 15 to 20%. Okay. So not only is wealth extremely unequally distributed, but it seems to be getting worse rather than better. Okay, so now let me go to a story that I talk about in Why Politics Fails. So I was in the room for this, but these are not my photos. These are stills taken from YouTube. But you can watch this event, which is um, the biennial meeting uh, that the Peterson Institute has organized by Olivier Blanchard and Danny Roderick, the economists. And they did one on inequality, which is why I was there as the kind of one of the token political scientists. But I was not the main attraction, sadly. No, not even close to the main attraction. This was the main attraction to which I was like, you know, in that on the bill in that font you can't quite read at the bottom. And this is Emmanuel Saiz versus Larry Summers. Okay, so Emmanuel Saiz, the French economist, now at Berkeley, along with Gabriel Zuckman, also a French economist, also at the University of California, Berkeley, had developed a wealth tax plan um, that both Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren had adopted. Saiz and Zuckman had their own slightly different version, but in all of these cases, it was a tax on the net wealth of America's multimillionaires and billionaires. And Emmanuel Saiz motivated that with this graph that you can see. Now I try the pointer and that works, okay? Which looks quite similar to at least the latter side of it to the graph that we just saw, okay? Of rising wealth inequality in the United States of America. This is the point, top 0.1% rather than the top 1%, but you get the point. Okay, so Saiz goes up and he gives his presentation about why we should have a wealth tax and what the motivation for it is, is and how to do it and how to avoid some of the difficulties about people trying to avoid it. Then Summers gets up. Now, Larry Summers is also a Democrat. Larry Summers, of course, is a Democrat associated with the Obama administrations and the Clinton administration, uh, and also associated with a, a doomed Harvard presidency. 
Uh, but he did mean does mean he's a character in the social network, which is very funny if you if you watch that movie. So Summers is a big beast of democratic politics. And he gets up and he says, Look, I've been following some of this debate about Saiz's plan on Twitter for the last few days, and I find myself in 98% agreement with his opponents. And then the kind of room darkens, and Summers kind of rolls up his sleeves and for 10 minutes just trashes every aspect of this kind of rival Democrats' wealth plan. It can't work. It won't work because at the end of the day, wealth just comes from income. So why not just tax income? I'm a, I love the welfare state too, just pay for it out of income taxes. It won't work because there'll be avoidance. People will find cunning ways to get around it. It won't work because extremely wealthy people will spend all their wealth down, just like Elon Musk promised to do for Bernie Sanders. Indeed, they'll spend all of their money thanks to the Supreme Court um, deciding on unlimited campaign contributions, funding PACs, funding political organizations to stop the wealth tax. So it won't work and it can't work. And this is the debate that's been roiling American politics for the last few years. So in this David versus Goliath, where David is the billionaires, David keeps on, on winning, right? The, the mass public aren't, aren't getting a wealth tax. And I think there's a question about why two nominally center-left economists can't even agree on this. What is it that makes wealth taxation so difficult? Well, one of the reasons, and now I'm just drawing out the historical pattern of wealth distribution. This is me being cheeky. This is a graph from 1975, present. This is the same graph, but extended back to 1900. Is that our wealth inequality today is certainly high compared to that of the baby boomers in their youth in the 60s and 70s, right? It is higher. But it's nowhere near as high, especially in Europe, as it was at the turn of the 20th century, where it was far, far higher. And the UK here goes on a particularly dramatic decline. That's the, um, that's the line that sort of collapses down an enormous amount. But you can see this with France and Sweden as well. Just a huge, huge change. So, you know, one reason we might not have a wealth tax is that in the very long run, it actually doesn't look that bad. Or another way to put it is wealth is always really unequally distributed. It's much less so today than it was in the pre-democratic past. Democracies have responded by creating the types of taxes we'll talk about today. So that's one answer. Still, I don't think that helps us explain that much the more recent period, which was my first time series graph, the period from 1960s and 1970s to the present, because although we did see that wealth inequality is rising everywhere, wealth taxation is declining everywhere over that same period. And so if you believe the Meltzer Richard model, and perhaps you don't for good reason, uh, that would have us predict that higher inequality leads to higher demand for redistribution. But precisely the opposite is happening all across Europe. Um, don't look at the graph on the left. It's too complex for me to explain. So I'm just going to do the one on the right. So um, a couple of the people we saw earlier, Law Bacospa and Mads Elkia and I, but really them, coded top marginal rates across, I think it's 19 European, North American, you know, the usual kind of rich countries that Esping Anderson created as our baseline data set. Um, we coded the top marginal rate paid by the richest people paying inheritance taxes. Okay, so this is the top rate that people would pay. And then we take the average of that across the countries and we look at it over time. So that's the graph on the right. And so you can see that average rate was about 40% in the 1960s and it's less than 20% today. And we can split that out by country. Um, so it's actually still 40% in the United Kingdom, which you can see down the bottom. It was higher. So inheritances uh, you paid over 75% on uh, if you were the richest uh, person who died. Uh, that's gone down to 40. The US uh, is also quite high if you pay the estate tax, although the threshold for that is now above $12 million. So it's a pretty high threshold but it's still 40%. But a bunch of other countries like Canada and Australia and Norway and Sweden and, uh, have removed the inheritance tax entirely, Austria as well. Okay, They've all, They don't have an inheritance tax. It doesn't mean they have no wealth taxes or gift taxes. They may have some of those, but the inheritance tax has gone during a period in which inequality has been rising. Okay, And I think that should surprise us. Uh, and so, you know, the question that's going to motivate the rest of today's talk in the 40 minutes I have, I keep reminding myself of that, is, okay, well, what's going on? Like, why don't people like wealth taxation? Um, and I've given this talk to um, conservative think tanks. Obviously, they're very happy about this. 
and I've given it to Labour Party think tanks, and they're pretty unhappy about this. Uh, and I've given it to groups of people called things like patriotic millionaires, who are the groups of people who want to pay more, and they're really, really unhappy about this because they're the ones who think that all rich people should want to pay. And it does seem it does seem tricky to understand why this is happening. So let's do that example where I'm where I'm talking to people at the moment, which is the United Kingdom. And let me tell you what wealth taxation looks like in the UK and how people feel about it. We'll move specifically onto the inheritance tax later, because that's the, the biggie that we ask lots of questions about. Uh, but what I want to start with is a simpler question we asked, which was to get a sense of people's, you know, detaching people from disliking any particular tax, because as we'll see in a second, people often have real reasons they don't like inheritance taxation. We're going to draw it out a bit more and, and you know, go back to those wealth inequality versus income inequality statistics and say to ourselves, well, let's just ask about how people, if they had to pull a slider, and I literally, of course, make them pull a slider on a virtual screen. They're not actually pulling a physical slider, I should note. This is an online survey with YouGov. Uh, I ask them to pull a slider between zero and 10, between would you prefer a tax system that taxed people's wealth more, meaning their property, savings, and inheritances, those are the words we use, or one that taxes people's income from work. Okay. And the first thing you see when you do this, or when we saw when we did this, is that actually taxing people's income from work is more popular on average than taxing people's wealth. In other words, taxing earned income is more popular than taxing unearned income and wealth. Um, so there are, of course, an excellent group of 25% of the British population who are just even don't move the slider. <laughs> Although I do think we, we gave it a random position, so I guess they have to move it to the middle. They didn't want to answer the question one way or the other. But of people who make a choice, we get slightly more leaning towards income taxation. And wealth taxation. And as I say, that ought to surprise us a bit because wealth is more unequally distributed in Britain than is income. And because of some sort of basic fairness considerations that work after all does come from effort and skill in your, and reward, whereas that's not always true with wealth. Some of your wealth, of course, is your previously earned income, but then we ought to see that sort of filtering into the income part of this equation. A lot of it comes from getting it from your parents or your house going up in value, essentially arbitrarily from your perspective, right? You bought a house in a nice part of London in the 1980s and it went up from 300,000 pounds to 3 million and you didn't really do anything other than stay in it. Seems like luck, but people don't want to tax that. Okay, so what I'm gonna do now is show you some um, statistics in terms of groups, just simple group averages. I guess with standard errors, that's what the... Uh, the little T's are here. Um, so this is just to, to give you a sense by political party what people think about this. And what I'm doing here is putting people between zero and one, where zero is indifferent or prefer to tax income, and one is prefer to tax wealth. So if you like, if you answered zero to four on the last question, this one, prefer wealth taxes, you get coded as one, everybody else gets coded as zero. Okay, and so only in the Labour Party and in the Scottish National Party, do around, and only just around, half of people prefer to tax wealth. And elsewhere, if you look, for example, at, oh, I don't know, the Conservative Party, you can only find a quarter of them there. But so there's not a generally high level of support. It does fit with the kind of partisan parameters you would expect in the United Kingdom. NA, over here, by the way, is not some kind of weird party you haven't heard of called the National Alliance or something. It's not applicable. These are, these are people who... Uh, can't recall or didn't vote uh, in, in the general election of 2019. Um, but it's worth noting here that non-voters aren't all big fans of taxing wealth. They're kind of meh. And we'll see that kind of mehness being an important part of explaining why we don't have high levels of wealth taxation as I go through this presentation. I'm just showing this to you essentially to boast that I ran a multi-level regression with post-stratification, otherwise known as an MRP poll. Um, this is, I had 6,000 observations. So what I was able to do with that and the demographic data I needed for each constituency was create a constituency level estimate with error bands. I won't show you the error bands. That would be too nerdy for every constituency in the United Kingdom. And then I got a whole bunch of MPs and MPs like advisors asking me to send them the data so they could figure out like how much do people in my constituency like wealth taxation. Um, 
and I did one of these for building houses and they were even more concerned about it then. So, you know, I think this is as reliable as any other MRP poll. It's a better local estimate than, than we would get without the demographic data, but re make of it what you will. The colors of these hexes here are the party they voted for in 2019. The overall geography is supposed to look like the United Kingdom. Um, the fact that Wales and Scotland you know, are big places without many people explains why they look a bit shrunken. But the other thing that makes things look shrunken is the size of the hex here is proportional to the level of support for wealth taxation. Okay, so I have done that myself. So if you have a squeezed looking hex like you do, kind of ringing London in blue, that means lots of wealthy areas in the southeast of England really hate taxing wealth. And the places that generally like taxing wealth where the hexes are fatter, well, they're in Scotland and in the north of England, right? So that fits roughly with what you would think. And of course, they're where people tend to vote for Labour. But they're also in what was called the Red Wall, which are all of these constituencies that Boris Johnson won for the first time often in 2019 uh, that had traditionally been Labour areas. OK, so there is support for taxing wealth in the country. It's not a majority and it's actually somewhat split across these blue and red areas. Now, something very funny is this, which is the constituency with the very lowest support for wealth inequality, uh, taxing wealth, sorry, in the country by my estimates, which is Hayes and Harlington. And Hayes and Harlington is uh, represented by John McDonnell, and you probably don't know who he is, but Daniel does. He was Labour's chancellor, uh, shadow chancellor under Jeremy Corbyn. So he would have been the most likely person in the country to introduce a wealth tax which I guess says something about the degree to which people represent the preferences of their constituents. All right, that's enough of that. Let's do something um, that you can only do um, much more easily these days because of online surveys, and that's look at open-ended answers. So I think this is something that I strongly recommend people do if they run a survey, um, is ask people to, you can do it very easily on YouGov, I assume you can do it on Kantar as well, um, although we didn't later with our Kantar analysis. Ask people basically to write a sentence about why they gave the answer they did. Now, obviously, you don't want to do this for too many questions because no one wants to keep writing your essays. But if, but we did find, for the most part, that people wanted to answer this question. You got very few people being like, F you, I don't want to do this. That, was the, that would be their answer. A couple of people do that. But they couldn't leave it blank. Uh, and we, we got a lot of interesting answers, and I'll show you that in a second. But we do two types of things that I'll show you with that data. So this is... Immediately after you do the slider, you're then asked, okay, well, why did you pull the slider to where you pulled it? So we run what's called a keenness analysis. This is something that Stephanie Stancheva, the Harvard economist, has been doing a lot with her open-ended answers. So we kind of stole the idea from her and then cited her, I wanted. Um, what a keenness analysis does is basically kind of like a t-test by groups for words that are most associated with membership of a particular group. So in other words, you split your sample into groups and you say, what words are really associated with being a homeowner versus being a renter? What words are really associated with being over 50 or under 50? And, and those are the two examples I'll show you in a second. And what we'll see, and I'll show you this in a second, is that homeowners and over 50s, firstly, they don't tend to like taxing wealth. But secondly, what they talk about is things that you might associate with individual fairness, being treated equally, regardless of how wealthy you are, and wanting the equal right to divest yourself of your property as you see fit. Okay, so in my politics fails, I call this the kind of equal rights, equal outcomes, you know, the libertarian socialist trade-off. Renters and under 50s, what they talk about, and we'll come back to this later on, this dif difference, is instead of looking at the kind of what they perceive to be the individual fairness of being taxed, they look at the societal fairness of tax, or, sorry, of things, of taxation, but also of inequality. And so they'll talk a lot about the level of inequality in society, and wouldn't it be nicer to have equal outcomes, right? So we have a, a different set of views of fairness. The other thing we do, um, which I, I won't run you through how we do it, but we run some unsupervised machine learning, i.e. structural topic models, where we essentially cluster the 3,000 comments we get into 20 groups, and then we look, 20 topics, I should say, and then we look at the types of things people say in each topic. So what kind of expressions go together? And I'll give you some examples of those. And hold for now in your brain once you see these things. Huh, if people give these kinds of reasons and you had the opportunity to run another survey, could you change the framing 
of um, of the question you ask in ways that seem to motivate people? And would you get a different answer? And psych, we will, but we'll get there. Okay, so the only problem here is that, is that the colors for each side don't represent the same groups. I'm sorry about that. I forgot about that when I did it. So on the left side here, we're splitting people by non-homeowners and homeowners. So non-homeowners say words or are more, much more associated with words like hoard, inequality, everyone, everything, and rather brilliantly, I don't know. Uh, so I, I don't know if that's all they wrote in that. Um, so they're talking about kind of big picture items, you know, also with this kind of denigrating wealthy people, I guess, language with hoard. And on the right, um, we have um, saving, penalize, and on the right in both ways, right? Homeowners, save, saving, penalize, encourage, property, choose, individual behavior, individual liberties. Now, this group basically corresponds to this group. Over 50s, what are the kind of words they say? Encourage, save, property, saving, already, already, implying that they're already being taxed. And we'll come back to that. Retire, uh, include, I don't know what include is for that. <laughs> but under 50s, yeah, again, the same kind of thing, right? Hoard, coming back again, economy, benefit, IDK. Um, so this kind of differentiation in the types of language, the types of thinking that's going on. Let me now show you some examples of that. These are actual things whoop, that people wrote. Okay. So topic three is something associated basically with like renters and younger people. These are the types of things that people who like taxing income say, sorry, like taxing wealth, don't like taxing income. Uh, it's good to tax wealth given it's by definition, the bits of money that people have left over, I think is where that goes. Income has been worked on and deserved. You cannot tax people on income. This poor person is in for a shock. The majority of people spend most of their lives paying out from what they earn. People who stored assets, ridiculous money, should be taxed on it. How can people sit on millions and billions, right? Inheritance on their assets seems they aren't taxed as much or avoid paying it. And then on the right here, I just love that. I mean, it's very, very succinct. Otherwise, you're being taxed twice. Otherwise, you would be, that means practically the same thing. I don't know if it's like a husband and wife writing this down side by side on laptops. Um, you know, and, and here we have this this kind of rather narky question. This is when this is the person who resents answering the question, but still writes an incredibly long sentence. Such a short-sighted question that bears almost no. Okay, but somebody who nonetheless, despite being grumpy, uh, says that they, you know we shouldn't be taxing wealth. And down here, are kind of classic. Mm -hmm. You know, you want to give money to your loved ones. You've already paid tax on the money. You're being taxed twice. Those set of motivations, in particular, the ones down here, uh, we're going to see really, really matter for people. Okay. We asked people uh, in one of these surveys to give us their views about whether a particular tax was unfair or fair or neither. And in fact, it's actually a five-point scale. But we're here we have the fair and very fair. So the proportion think that. National insurance is basically the kind of social employment tax in the UK. Income tax is income tax. Dividends tax is tax on earned profits. Uh, council tax is our version of the property tax. Capital gains tax is what it says on the tin. Stamp duty is a property transactions tax, VAT, and a tax on interest and inheritance tax. Okay, what's the least popular thing? Or rather, what is the tax that most people think is unfair? Inheritance tax, tax on interest tax on property transactions. These are taxes on wealth. People hate them. What do people like? Paying 13% of their income uh, to the government for pensions or what they perceive to be pensions. But in fact, strictly speaking, the treasury doesn't just puts it all in a big pot, mixes it with all the other stuff. And they like income tax, right? And again, this I, I don't think is what certainly people on the left think people are going to answer like, right? This, this normally causes and... Uh, gasp when I show it to some people because you know you might think that look this is all unearned income but people don't like it um, what if I did something a little bit more Emmanuel Saiz like and I said what how would you feel about a net tax on the wealthiest households in the country like that surely should make people like taxing I mean maybe but I can get up to 56% now say support or strongly support 
I mean, that's better, but it's not really as good as one would hope when you do a question that's like, how would you like to tax really rich people? I mean, you would expect really strong support for that, but you don't get really strong support for it. At least I don't. Uh, it does have exactly the same kind of partisan balance that we saw earlier, right, with Labour and the SNP liking it a lot more than Conservatives. And here I have some demographics. So, look, it's less popular among old people, but it's not massively popular among the young. And education has almost zero effect at all. But what seems to matter a bit is that these people correctly identify the people who own properties worth over half, uh, sorry, three quarters of a million pounds or earn over 100,000 pounds, that they are probably the people who are in the wealthiest households of the country. Right? So, okay, that makes sense. But there's not a huge amount of support for it. You know, you might expect this group or this group to be excited, but they're not. And here we have uh, another question, which we'll see when we come to Europe again, about equalizing capital gains tax and income tax. So capital gains are taxed at a lower rate in the UK at 28% rather than the income tax rate that people pay. Again, you can get higher support because it doesn't really seem fair that tax is lower for unearned income than, than earned, but it's not that dramatic. And actually, the only thing that seems to, to matter is education. And the reason is, is because more educated people probably better understand what capital gains tax is. Um, and we'll get to this like people understanding thing in just a second. OK, so that leads me now to the kind of big crunchy part for the, for the next 10 minutes of the talk. Where I'm going to talk about the inheritance tax in the UK. So we've already just seen one thing, which is inheritance tax is really unpopular. It's the least popular of all of the wealth taxes. It is, however, the tax that is always in the news because it's a tax that everybody's heard of and it's been around for hundreds of years. And so Ken Sheedy and David Savage have a wonderful book called Taxing the Rich, which is largely about the creation of the inheritance tax and income tax systems. So it's these two kind of early taxes that emerge. Inheritances, of course, were easy to tax initially because they were largely tied to property, which is a thing that the state can measure. And it was a tax that would be incurred at death, right? So it was easy to know the moment that you would do it and to parcel things out. So UK has an inheritance tax we saw earlier. It's gone down a little bit from what it was in the 60s, but it's basically a, sim a very simple and quite heavy tax of 40% that applies to any bequest above £325,000. Okay, so that's to the bequest. It, it doesn't mean that you can give everybody £325, but £5,000 each. This is the total amount, no matter how it's split. But importantly, there's an exclusion for the main residence. That exclusion is half a million pounds per parent. So if, like me, you foolishly have divorced parents, then it only it applies to each of the parents individually. Uh, but if your parents remain married, then, then those get added. So if they own a million pound house and after they both die, that can then go on to their children without inheritance tax. So obviously that's a big relief. Uh, and in part that explains why very few estates actually pay it. Right? So only 3% of estates pay. It's largely people with houses worth more than that or with quite a lot of financial assets. It doesn't make up a lot of the country's tax revenue either um, because not many people pay it. Right? So it's not, it's not going to be a major item for governments to be able to engage in large spending plans but it is kind of totemic and it's totemic because the Labour Party have traditionally really liked it and you could see that from my voters earlier because it's it's a tax on unearned wealth and it's a tax really on the class system and conservatives hate it and have always hated it and yet weirdly the conservative party despite it being the least popular tax in the country have never got rid of it and, and to me, this is like the biggest mystery of British party politics, why the Conservative Party haven't tried to get rid of the inheritance tax. Um, but I suggest that a desperate Rishi Sunak might throw this one out there as red meat to try and get people to vote for the Conservative Party before the next election. And of all policies that I can think of him succeeding in getting some votes for, this is actually the one because people don't like this. right? And I don't want to be Keir Starmer trying to talk to the British public about why inheritance tax is so great when there's when there's not that very high level of support. But that does raise this big question. I've told you a lot that inheritance tax isn't popular. Why is it not popular? Why is it so unpopular? And so here's the, the argument that we make in this particular paper. So the first thing is people who own or stand to inherit expensive houses, and we're really going to focus on houses here despite the exclusion because we can measure houses much better. And also because, frankly, most people don't really know as much about the exclusion as you might expect. So people who own expensive houses should have pretty clearly defined material preferences over inheritance taxation, 
if you own or stand to inherit a very expensive house, you're probably not going to like inheritance taxation. I mean, it really is like less money that you're going to receive quite directly. And indeed, people's preferences ought to correlate well with the exact tax bracket they face. That is, they ought to shift around this kind of 325 or 500 thousand pounds set of thresholds people shouldn't be freaking out about the difference between 100 and 200 thousand pounds because neither of those levels of inheritance are taxed but people who don't own houses don't have strong preferences and this is really important for our paper um they might be ambivalent um they might find the inheritance tax too complicated and they're not really ever going to receive an inheritance they don't connect it to public spending and so what we're going to argue is that these people are sort of disconnected from the expectation that a kind of pure political economy approach would have, which would have them being poorer and therefore wanting to tax this stuff so it could be spent on other things. And so maybe these people who lack information or are ambivalent could be made to like inheritance tax more. And how could we do that? Well, the first thing we could do is say, look, the distribution of wealth is so unequal. Meltzer and Richard say that you should want higher taxation. Obviously, we wouldn't say that, but we, you know, we would maybe they just don't know that wealth is really unequal. So if we if we can show them that wealth is really unequal, then they'll want to tax it. And that's what traditional political economy views uh, would have you believe is going to happen. The other option is we could look at some of the framing that we saw from the questions earlier, and we could see if we could shift people. So we ought to be able to shift people away from inheritance tax by emphasizing all these individual fairness, double taxation stuff. And we ought to be able to shift people towards it by emphasizing the social fairness aspects or that you could spend the proceeds on other things. So we're going to do both of those. So we run two surveys. We ran one in 2021, nationally representative sample in England and Wales. We didn't have Scotland because of what we do involves land registry data that the Scots make you pay for. So my response to that was just to simply omit them from the survey. Um, we will have Scotland in the second survey. But what we were able to do is ask people questions about how much they thought their house was worth and how much they thought their house, parents' house was worth, or if they were renters, how much rent they paid. And then we matched them to the local authority they live in. There's about 340 local authorities in England and Wales. And we know from land registry data how much typical houses get sold at. So we can do a bit of a comparison between what we objectively know about house prices where you live and how much you've told us you're likely to pay. So we have lots of data on income, lots of data on wealth. And then we're going to ask a bunch of questions on the inheritance tax. We, of course, ask these other questions I've already shown you. And in particular, ask a question about whether you think inheritance tax is too high or too low. And so higher numbers on the dependent variable here are going to mean you think the inheritance tax is too high. So I know that's a bit annoying because higher numbers might make you think that you know, you're know you more redistributive in this. But no, it's people who don't like the inheritance tax. Okay, We have six versions of this question um, that, that in general that you would face, that your heirs would face. On inheritances below £325,000, you may recall, you get a prize for recalling that the actual inheritance tax below £325,000 is, of course, zero. Um, so it's probably not too high. 325 to a million and then over a million. And then we do something else that I'll show you in the second, which is we have them do a conjoint experiment comparing different inheritance tax schedules. I'll come back to that. Okay. The second survey that we ran in October 2022, on the 30th of October 2022, because that's what happens when your grant runs out on the 31st of October of 2022, um, was with 3,500 adults in the UK as a whole, uh, except Northern Ireland, I think, but it does include Scotland. Um, we don't do exactly the same experiment because, as you'll see in a second, in the first experiment, we have an informational experiment. Maybe I said that here. I did. Sorry but I didn't mention it. We have an informational treatment showing people the distribution of house prices. And I'll come back to that. We don't do that in the second one. Instead, we have a framing treatment and uh, people are going to be asked the same inheritance tax questions, but with different openings. So a control, the double taxation one, I'll show you these uh, in just a bit, a level playing field one, which is about social fairness. And then finally, a, a framing that emphasizes what you could spend the money on. So this is the Brexit bus framing, right? Here's what you could get if you did this. We ask people questions on house prices, and you can't get this in most surveys, except for the UK um, HLS and the British Household Panel Survey, which did ask. 
Uh, I wish more people would ask this question because I think you get pretty accurate answers. Why do I think that? Because here is the median house price given when we ran the first survey for each region in the country. And here is the median from the regions, same regions of the country that we got in the survey at the same time of our respondents. And it's really, really close, really surprisingly close. Uh, I was trying to figure out how YouGov could have faked the data and got this, and I couldn't come up with any good way. So I guess, firstly, I'm much more happy now to say that YouGov have good nationally representative samples, at least of homeowners. I don't know how it works for renters. And of course, renters are harder to get in surveys than homeowners. But among homeowners, actually, they're pretty accurate, surprisingly so. And in fact, you can do what I do on the right here, which is take each local authority. I have the actual median price from a couple of years early, because I was being a bit lazy in this graph. And then I have the median estimate in my survey. And the number here is the number of people in that local authority. So here there's nine people, and here there's 22 people, and here there's seven people, and so on. I just take the median person and how much they estimate their house was worth. And you can see it's a pretty good line of fit, given that you know we've got a whole bunch of observations where I've just got like seven or nine people here and just taking a median. You'll, also, you'll see that this is basically a one-to-one -one slope, but a slightly higher intercept, about 50,000 pounds higher. And there's two reasons for that. One is that this is 2019 and this is 2021. That's the simple reason. Uh, then there's something slightly complex uh, about the um, kind of weighting of the sample that we try to adjust for, and that gets you 10,000 pounds. And then British people are 10,000 pounds too optimistic. That's the bias. Okay, but otherwise, really close match. So uh, this data is all available online. I had to put it up as part of the ERC. So if you ever want data with house prices in, use it. And I think you can trust it. OK, so let's get to these questions about inheritance taxation. So these are annoying histograms because the thing on the right is different from the others. But there's a reason for that. So here's how people answer each of these six questions. You know, overall level of inheritance tax that you might pay, that your heirs might pay, and these low, medium, high inheritances. And on the right of this, we have the people who don't say, who don't know, who say don't know. And we let them say don't know. We'll do a forced choice in just a bit. So first thing is loads of people haven't got a clue about inheritance tax. Like it's normally about a third to 45% of people were like, I don't know, who are those people? We'll come to that in a second. The second thing to say is that except for inheritances over a million, the remaining five bars on this graph are always skewed to the right, which means people don't like inheritance taxes, that they would pay, that their heirs would pay, that would happen on low inheritances, all that stuff. They just don't, they don't like inheritance taxes. We knew that already, but here we're seeing it again. Now, who says don't know? Who expresses any opinion at all is what this is. And so here we have, um, I'm a, this is the only regression table I'm going to show you. My apologies. Um, well, my apologies, I'm showing you a regression table. Not apologies, but I don't have more. Zero here is, I, I don't know. And one is, I am I do know, I have an answer. Okay. And so, we have a baseline category here, uh, which is renter or non-owner, actually. And then here we have, in a linear probability model and a logit, uh, a kind of discretized version of how much your house is worth. And so linear probability models are easier. Um, once we get up to people who own houses worth between 100 and 200,000 pounds, they're 6% more likely to offer an opinion. About 300,000 pounds, 17%. We get up to about 20%. 20% more likely to offer an answer than a renter about this question. Well, that's quite a large lift. We also have estimates of parents' houses, because of course that's actually what you're gonna you're gonna be getting. You know, you're, when you die, you don't feel the pain of the inheritance tax that somebody else pays. You might of course not want it in the future, but you will be dead. Um, so parents' house, uh, we have a slightly smaller effect, but it's still about 13%. And then we have some of the things you would expect, that richer people by income are more likely to express an opinion, so older people, Men, of course, are 12% more likely to express an opinion. I mean, it's like the most, most universal fact in social survey research that men just can't, like, don't know. Uh, but weirdly enough, there's no, there's no effective degree. So I, I don't know why that is. It may be subsumed by the age and other things. To give you a sense of the kind of breadth of, of difference here, this is a 95% probability for someone with high wealth status. What's that? That is a 50-year-old man with a degree owning a £500,000 house in the top income quartile. This here is a female renter in the bottom income quartile uh, who is in her 20s. So this gives you a sense of the kind of likely range, you know, that the, the female 
uh, example I have there, only about 40% chance that man, you know, there's a very tiny chance he won't answer this question. Okay, what about levels? I'm going to show you some coefficient plots here. We have parent stuff on the right. It's, um, this is uh, low, sorry, no, it's not on the right. Parents is on the bottom, and it's always a bit fuzzier. So on the left, we have the levels of inheritance in general that you might pay, and then the different inheritances. The only things I just want you to note here are that as we move out, people with more expensive housing, they consistently think inheritance taxes are too high. That's what being to the right here is. It doesn't work quite as well, frankly, with parents, but you can see the same kind of move out. Okay. It's not as robustly measured. Uh, and then here with the difference of the uh, types of inheritance, the really funny thing is the red line here is, is low inheritances. And you can see that rich people don't give a crap about low inheritances. They care about high inheritances, which I guess is extremely ruthlessly uh, self-interested. And we'll see that come up with the Europeans. So there's quite strong evidence in these cases. Okay, we also ran a conjoint experiment. And the conjoint has people choose uh, between different inheritance tax schedules. And so basically you see these four categories and you get an, a set, one of each of these. So maybe it's 10%, 20%, 40%, 60%. And you're comparing it against another schedule. So we're asking people to kind of pick the order of progressivity of the tax schedule and you do it five times. Okay. And with that, then we can get a, a guesstimate of how people feel about taxes. Now, it's a little bit confusing on this graph, especially when you see the next one, because it goes, this is for the lowest inheritances, 0, 10, 20. So as we go up, we get the higher tax rates. You can see on average, people don't like 20% inheritances for uh, taxes on low inheritances or 40% taxes on moderate sized inheritances. Okay. As, but what they do like is sort of 10, 20% taxes on these inheritances. And in particular, for inheritances over a million, they're actually quite excited about taxing them at a 60 or 80% rate. So people in general have quite progressive preferences. But there's a couple of other interesting things we can do with this. One is that we can look uh, at, oh, I won't do the income tax, so I'll leave that for another day. We can look at people by the value of their own house. So the Dark red dots here are people with houses worth more than £500,000. And you can see that on moderate to large inheritances, this group of people here, 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 and here have much more kind of extreme extended preferences than the people with less expensive housing, because they're the ones who are going to be hit. Whereas down here, they're actually towards the middle. So this group of people with lots of property don't really care so much about the inheritances that poorer people face, and they do care a lot about the ones that they do face. So people are quite kind of viciously rational about this, is how I would describe that. And we'll see this again with the European data if I get to it, which I will. Okay. The final thing to just note is that you might think earlier that the people who said don't know in our inheritance tax question actually would like high inheritance taxes if only we could ask them if only we could get, sorry get them to answer the question right they're saying don't know but they really like in higher inheritance taxes if that were true we would expect black don't know to be more extreme for these inheritance tax questions than people who do answer that question but actually they're more moderate so here we are with moderate inheritances and as you can see they are less extreme. They're less likely to want 80% or 40% tax rates. So don't know is are ambivalent. When you force them to make a choice, they actually are slightly less pro-inheritance tax. All right. I'm going to run through this quite quickly because I'm closing in on my hour. Okay. We try an information treatment where we show people this slightly crazed housing ladder that I created 340 versions of using some R coding wizardry that I've now forgotten how to do. Um, but essentially, everybody, um, depending on where they lived, was matched with a picture. And that picture, if they lived in Greenwich, would look like this. And if it looked, if they lived in Burnley, it would look like something else. And it was setting out the distribution of housing prices. These are the essentially the median, the 95th percentile, the 10th percentile, and so on for where they lived and for England and Wales. And I had a picture of a kind of Wendy house and a mansion uh, and to, I guess, motivate them. I then asked them questions. Do you understand what the hell I just showed you? Because you might think they didn't. About 67% of them did. 
I don't know if that's particularly good or bad. Uh, we split people into not seeing this thing at all, good for them, seeing seeing this kind of national and local or just the national presses. Just just see like, okay, does this does telling people, gosh, you know, in Greenwich, you know, the top ten percent of people have these nice eight hundred thousand pound houses. Does that push them? Well, the answer is no. There's no effect to this at all. Now, it might be because my treatment is bad. I mean, it seems quite plausible. Um, but it's also consistent with what Stephanie Stanchaver and other scholars have found, which is information treatments don't seem to affect behavior very much at all. I'm going to jump now to the framing experiment. because I do want to do a little bit on you. Here are the frames that we asked in the second survey about the inheritance tax. You can just see what they are. I've kind of told you what they are already. Double taxation. It's kind of social fairness, level playing field language, number two. And then this government revenues, Brexit bus kind of thing, spend there on the NHS. Okay, so these work. So red here is the death tax treaty. Remember, higher numbers mean you like inheritance tax less, you think it's too high. You can shift people by about 15% points just by mentioning that. You can, so the inheritance tax is already not popular. You can make it even less popular by mentioning double taxation. Social fairness, the yellow, has no effect at all. People are not driven by this. Now, it might be that left-wing voters who don't like inheritance tax and believe this frame aren't going to be shifted. And the people you want to shift don't care. But if you want to shift people towards inheritance tax, then you need to say you can have public goods or you can lower other taxes. The blue line here, right? That matters. So in other words, the trade-off is not between individual and social fairness, if you want to move people, because people don't care about social fairness, at least in a way that moves their answers. But they do care about potential material benefits. So were I advising people on how to make the inheritance tax more popular, that's what I'd ask them to do. All right. So let me finish finally with some new data, which I promised have about five minutes on wealth taxation in Europe. Okay. So we also, in 2022, ran a multi-country survey. And this we're still working on the data here because we have too much data, basically. Um, Denmark, France, Germany, Ireland, Italy, Netherlands, Sweden, about 1,250 people in each of these countries. We asked them the same types of questions. The overall wealth income slider question, uh, and then specific wealth tax questions like net wealth tax, equalizing capital gains of income tax, and those um, inheritance tax questions slightly adjusted, because obviously I'm not talking about pounds. I think we do it. We come up with different levels of inheritances um, on properties worth a certain amount of the median income. Again, we ran some information experiments, Stephanie Stanchaver style, to say, if showing does showing you the this in this case, it was like, how much does the top 10% have? It was a much simpler thing. Top 10% of wealthy people, how much, what share do they have? Show them that or not. Basically, that also doesn't matter. I'm not going to show you the data because I haven't, haven't got it prepared. But long story short, information, again, doesn't seem to matter. And we also ran a conjoint. I'm just going to show you a couple of interesting things from this, and then I'll end the lecture. This is support for the net wealth tax on the wealthiest households in society. The dotted line here is the UK, which you already saw. And you can see that basically there's quite high levels of support for that, but not really any higher than there are in the UK. So it's just about a majority. And you can see the two places where people don't like it is Scandinavian countries. And that should make you worry if you like net wealth taxes, because where are taxes high? The Scandinavian countries. So this is, this is people, con this is basically tax concern from those countries. Um, and so it suggests that there's probably a thermostatic effect going on. Equalizing capital gains tax rates, uh, you, you know, the same, same pattern with the Swedes and the Danes with much lower support. Actually, the UK has the highest support for this. So UK is most pro-tax in that case. And then here are the distributions, just like earlier with don't know on the right, of answers to these questions. Now, we've got, um, we got fewer don't knows. We might have asked the question better uh, by the time we got to the European one. Um, but still, I want you to notice that even for inheritances above a million, these are slightly right skewed, right? So Europeans also don't like taxing inheritances. The net wealth tax, that you can get a little bit higher support for, but it's mostly in this agree rather than strongly agree category. And the same is true of capital gains tax. In the middle, we have income taxes because we asked a whole bunch of questions on that too. And you can see that, frankly, the income tax questions look kind of similar to the inheritance tax questions. And the only place where you can get people to say taxes are too low is on people who earn twice the average income, not on inheritances. I mean, twice the average income is not that much money, but that's what motivates people. Right? So they want to tax income, not assets. 
Uh, and we can have a look at each of these dependent variables here. We have the net wealth tax, capital gains tax, taxes on small inheritances, moderate inheritances, large ones, taxes on low income, middle income, high income people. And we can just compare people to renters or don't owners of people with differently valued houses here. So on the right, support for the wealth tax goes down as people's property goes up in value. Capital gains tax is a similar effect, but it's less dramatic. For inheritances, a very similar thing, but notice kind of what we saw before, which is that people with expensive houses don't give a crap about the inheritances that people with unexpensive properties will pay, just don't care. They care about the ones that they will face. Right? So we get this spreading out here. Right? So again, very, I mean, consistent behavior. Uh, I don't think anyone has done this work before. So I guess these are new survey results. I don't think they're surprising, but it's sort of useful to know. What I think is a bit surprising is how much people with expensive houses in Europe don't care about taxing low income people. So, you know, this kind of almost spiteful behavior by rich people, it, that I find a little bit more surprising. Okay. Because otherwise, actually, there's not a huge difference in views about income taxation across these groups. And so, I don't know, these are a bunch of kind of Randians on expensive housing in Europe. And then we can also compare people who own their property outright to those who have a mortgage, that's the baseline category, and those who rent and those who have some other status. So basically, outright owners are less supportive of wealth taxation and capital gains tax than owners with mortgages, and renters like both of those things more. Right. So there's a housing tenure difference. That's sort of there a bit with inheritances for renters, but actually no real difference with inheritance taxes between owners and mortgage owners. And then here we have the income ones where you will not be surprised to discover that people who own their house outright also want the poor to pay more in taxes, given what I've shown you earlier. Right. So this is this is a new phenomenon from this paper. Um, final thing to say is we also ran a conjoint survey. Um, these are people's income tax preferences, um, where we have essentially discovering that people don't want to tax low incomes very much. They do want to tax high incomes. But inheritance taxes are actually more narrowly cast. In other words, the main thing to notice from this graph is people have more extreme views about the progressivity of the income tax schedule than they do about the inheritance tax schedule. Okay, so why don't people like wealth taxes? I can finally finish. Well, maybe there's not really that much of a puzzle at all, you know, i.e. given high wealth inequality, why isn't wealth being taxed? It's because, well, people don't like taxing wealth because people who own the wealth have very strong, very rational preferences, and people who don't own wealth don't care. Now, if, if they did care, then it's possible they might be able to draw the dots between taxing the wealth of the rich and spending it on things that would benefit them. And we saw that a little bit with the framing, but you have to push poorer people a lot to get those kinds of answers. Okay, if anything, the more extreme behavior is always being driven by the people with the more expensive property, whether that's wanting lower taxes on themselves or wanting poorer people to pay more, but they're the ones who are doing the work in our survey. Okay, and so wealth taxes are declining because homeowners don't like them. There are a majority in every country except Germany, and non owners don't care. So rising wealth inequality could make this more germane. We might say, gosh, it's such an unequal world at the moment. Maybe there's a big burgeoning demand. It's, you know, we are the 99. It's uh, the dark night rises, robs Pierre's back. But none of that seems to be coming up in the data at all. Okay, so, and I'm certainly not finding that exposing people to information about inequality is wakening them from their false consciousness. I don't think so. However, framing does matter. And one of the ways you get at frames is by asking people questions, you know, to answer, like, why do you feel about wealth the way that you do? And that we then find does seem to be able to push people a little bit, at least around the margin. So I'll stop there. Thank you.